uh, uh, Professor Verma. Uh, am I audible? Kindly, kindly put a small little chat message which says that I'm audible. So that I can start. Okay. So good afternoon. And um, at the outset, I need to thank uh, Dr. Somu Singh and uh, my good friends, uh, Patanjali Mishra and Dr. Gaurav Singh and many others. Well, uh, today's session of mine is, is focusing on the, on the topic or the theme, returning the wheel of learning. Well, the focus of my session is on returning the wheel of learning, which means a turnaround in a practice, thereby making students leaders of their own learning so that they will be able to innovate, reflect, critic, debate, collaborate, question, try out, commit blunders, live life, and the list goes on. Let me briefly transport you to 1818 when we were faced by the cholera pandemic, followed by the influenza pandemic, infamously known as the Spanish flu. Some do believe that the flu broke out in Spain and hence the name Spanish flu. You know, people always have their uh, ways of thinking. Well, the, uh, the, the flu pandemic disrupted schooling and there was a lockdown and social distancing, as you see what's happening during COVID. Though I do not have sufficient reliable information to describe the magnitude of the damage. But yes, both the pandemics disrupted society. And in 2020, we have the COVID-19. What is the impact of COVID-19 on the global order? What is its impact on the citadels of learning? And when I say citadels of learning, I mean schools and institutions of higher learning and the whole education system per se, per se across the whole world. Well, dear friends, it has impacted our attitudes, our thoughts, the way we reason, our way of life. In short, it has somehow changed our lives. It has disrupted the nations of the world. It has slowed, it has mowed, and even blown off the efforts of a century, if not more. From shutdown of schools and institutions of higher learning, to postponement of assessment activities and examinations, to entrance tests and competitive examinations, every single thing is derailed from a pattern of functioning to a total disarray. The circle of life is crumbling. However, surprisingly, in India, our systems of learning which are looked upon as more traditional, more conservative, and probably less dependent on technology, jumping the digital and online learning bandwagon during the lockdown is really exemplary. Teachers who hardly made an effort to embed digital tools in their practice or even to know of tech tools in learning spaces suddenly began expressing interest and participating in online learning and even conducting online sessions to maintain the continuity of learning. Institutions have begun partnering with other institutions to enlighten faculty, students and the concerned members of society. More than any other sector, I'm sure, though I don't have statistics, education is bombarded with online conferences, webinars, and the list goes on. In a way, we can say that technology has stepped into our systems in a big way, and it will continue to play a key role in educating the future generations, no matter what one has to say. So the power of technology has stepped into 
not only our systems of learning, but other walks of life in a very strong way and in different forms. Well, this is a good sign. It indicates that we are willing to change in the face of the inevitable. We are willing to experiment. We are willing to be innovative and we are willing to be creative. While we know that the impact of COVID-19 will be far reaching, what none of us know at this point of time is for how long this pandemic will last and what will, it, what will be its effect on schooling, education and learning, not only in our country but across the world. But yes, we do see a ray of hope. We do know that post-pandemic, our institutions of learning, our portals of learning will open once again. But friends, do we need to wait for, a disaster, for such disastrous situations and pandemics to reform our educational practice? Can we turn the wheel of learning or can the wheel of learning be returned or realigned so that our learning spaces, when I mean learning spaces, I basically mean our schools and all institutions of learning, be it higher learning or within the school learning system. I call them learning spaces. So, uh, be it in class or out of class, become meaningful, dynamic, novel, resilient and more humane, can we foster crucial 21st century skills which are very much required, which, which will be extremely helpful in the uncertain future? We are at the threshold of the third decade of the 21st century and probably we do not know, but permit me to say that probably COVID-19 has walked in as a reminder to tell humankind to prepare, educate and train ourselves in novel ways so as to be ready for the future, to be ready for the future or perish. Let us stop and ask ourselves an honest question. Aren't you and I surviving in the 21st century with a 20th century education and undoubtedly you would say yes we are but for how long are we going to sustain how long are we going to maintain and how, how long are we going to nurture ourselves what about the generation z the the, the british uh, call it generation z whereas the americans call it generation z and this generation uh, ranges with birth, uh, birth years somewhere from 1995-1996 till 2012-2013. So, so, so that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the year frame for the Gen X learners. What about our Gen Alpha learners? Our Gen Alpha learners are those born after the birth year 2013 and who will be around say six and a half, seven years, somewhere around this time. What about them? Our society is faced with so many challenges and so many uh, difficulties and the third decade of the 21st century isn't going to be like the earlier two decades that we have already seen. Unemployment, not only in our country but across the world is at its highest with the per capita income sliding of fragile GDP, irreversible environmental damage and the need to save the earth. Water crisis, depleting non-renewable sources, resources, conquering disease, bridging the skill wisdom gap and the list goes on. But dear friends, we cannot shy nor run away from this stark reality other than grounding ourselves in knowing that real learning is the key to progress. We must develop foresight. We need to develop foresight because without foresight, we are lost. 
So we need to be, we need to develop foresight and we need to develop those skills. We need to build those competences that are required that will help us in the third decade of the 21st century and way beyond. As of today, we do not know what this decade has to unfold for us. We do not know what the job market will be. We do not know what the skills will be and the sub skills will be. We are speculating, but nevertheless, all these skills will come handy for us. So as the first decade of the 21st century began to unfold, the global need to acquire and develop 12 core competences that would help individuals to succeed in the knowledge driven fourth industrial age were categorized into three cardinal groups as follows. The first one being learning skills and they were called the four C's and the four C's comprised critical thinking, creativity, collaboration and communication. The four prominent skills and we talk a lot about the four skills sorry talk about these four c's in education and learning how much have we addressed the skills is a question we need to reflect and ask ourselves the second one is literacy skills which are called imt and i stands for information literacy m stands for media literacy and the third one stands for technological literacy again we have moved 20 years or two decades of the 21st century. Again, we need to stop at this point of time and ask ourselves this question. What have we done? And the third one is life skills, which goes by the acronym FLIPS, F-L-I-P-S. And what does it stand? It stands for flexibility. It stands for leadership, initiative, productivity, and social skills. My dear friends, all these skills or all these three categories of schools of skills are extremely important for us. For us as educators and for our learners as well. How can we develop these skills in our learners? So what is the blueprint to take off? Can it start with our classrooms? Definitely yes. Can it start with us teachers? And I would say yes. That means all these are possible. Now, even before we think of fostering the skills in our learners, we as teachers need to re-engineer our perception and our mindset. The way we think, the way we approach, it needs to change. In a way, we need to re redefine our role as educators. The student is not an empty black slate, is not an empty black slate that remains blank and black until the so-called teacher writes wisdom in white on it. Nor is the child an empty vessel unless the teacher pours some liquid knowledge into it. Teaching is neither the transmission of knowledge nor dispensing of information and neither is learning acceptance of knowledge that is dispensed but if you look if you look very closely you will still find this practice wherein though we may not call a child a blank slate or an empty vessel but yes we believe that knowledge is dispensed we believe that we need to give information but we fail to realize that today our students are brilliant and bright. They are creators of knowledge, they are creators of information. They can process information. All that we need to do is we need to navigate. We need to channelize the learner. Children and our learners have a lot of creativity in them. They have a lot of critical thinking in them. All that we require to do is we just need to tickle them a little, tickle the mind a little, and then the neurons start firing. And when they start firing, it's unimaginable. Well, the Gen Z learners are to varying extent capable of taking on or handling life's challenges. 
But if they don't, then we teachers and bulldozer parents. You know who are bulldozer parents? There are two kinds of parents. One is called the helicopter parent. And the second one is called the bulldozer parent. So the helicopter parent is the one who goes around the child the whole, the whole time long hovering. You know, just, just like a helicopter. And the second parent, that is the bulldozer parent, will look around the learner. My child, the moment they see a difficulty or an obstacle in front of the child, they will demolish or do away with the difficulty rather than allowing the child to even tackle that difficulty or that disturbance or that challenge that stands before them. So in other words, what we have done is we are creating a secure world for them by inhibiting the natural tendencies to observe, to understand, to analyze, to create a perception of the world they live in. My dear friends, the mindset, the mood, and the overall classroom atmosphere begins with the teacher. And hence we say that the teacher brings life into a class, brings color into a class, and brings spice into a, into a class. So life, spice, and color, ingredients that make a classrooms happy. If educators, we educators are passionate and display passion and excitement about the subject we teach, students in some way will begin to follow us. A happy learning climate creates a happy learning space which satisfies not only the learner but also the teacher. So a humble plea to all of us teachers and to become and to be teachers to return the will of learning. I want to uh, I want to I want to cite a small illustration. Uh, I enrolled hundred of my hundred students of mine for the Swayam post. It was an ICT in in teaching. And uh, in the year 2018, Goa University was an examination center for Swayam. But in 2019, unexpectedly, it was not a center. And so. Uh, students had to go out of Goa to neighboring states and answer examinations. Well, there were many who, you know, who did not want to go out of state to answer examinations. But there were 10 students and I call them brave because these 10 students, seven of them went all the way to Pune, 750 kilometers by hiring a vehicle. And three of them went to Belgaum, answered their exams and cleared that Swayam um, uh, a MOOCs program with a high first class. They believed, they believed in me. They believed that this is the future. And I'm very grateful to these students and thankful to them for believing and trusting my words. So what can we as teachers do? What can we, how can we return the will of learning? Well, uh, the first thing is, Training the heart. In the words of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, I quote, educating your mind without educating your heart is no education at all. Unquote. Sorry. We have been talking a lot about Education of the affective dimension. What has happened? A few millennia later, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama too said, and I quote, It is vital that when educating our children's brains, do not neglect to educate their hearts by nurturing their compassionate nature. And yes, I have another quote by the great Swami Vivekananda, and I quote, we need the kind of education by which character is formed. Strength of mind increases, the intellect is expanded, and by which one can stand on one's own feet. If education does not train the heart, then it is no education at all. Creating a compassionate, a loving, caring, learning environment 
is what a learning space is need today. Our pedagogy is more focused on teaching content. We are more concerned about development of the cognitive faculty. But what about the affective faculty? We have something which is known as the pedagogy of the heart. And there are classics written, for, for instance, there is this book by Paulo Freire, which, uh, which is titled uh, uh, Pedagogy of the Heart. So I think we as educators need to once again revisit this fundamental dimension, this fundamental attribute and look at it. Along with the thinking world, my dear friends, we need, we need the feeling being. We need the emotional being, we need this, uh, the social being, and we need the spiritual being. Life skills training is inevitable. Some of the many skills that we need to be developed in our learners are self-awareness, being aware of ourselves, learning to manage and regulate ourselves, compassion. During COVID, I'm sure, we have used, if not many, at least some of these attributes of the affective dimension. Compassion, empathy, assertiveness, equi equanimity. Equanimity is, is the balance of the mind or evenness of the mind when we are under stress. Under stress, you know, we are like a pendulum. We go from one extreme to the, uh, to the other extreme. And it becomes difficult for students to handle life. And that's the reason why we find students who are unable to handle their lives. We see suicidal tendencies. We see depression and anxiety in our young learners. How do we, how do we teach them to manage life? So education of the heart along with education of the mind develops a personality. Expo exposing learners to the purpose and the power of education. Education is not all about becoming a big person, a rich person, or having, you know, n number of degrees, you know, when a big heavy bag and I put it on my bag and I say, hey, this is what I am. It is all about being someone who can, who can understand and someone who can be understood, who can exercise the power of the mind, feelings and actions. Teaching our learners to rise above mediocrity, above religious denominations, casteism, originalism is extremely important. A conscious effort to make learning holistic is what our society needs in the present time. To be ready for the future. My classroom becomes a place for all learners, irrespective of who they are and what they are. My, my classroom is a place for heterogeneity and diversity. My classroom is a place where I welcome everybody because we need to remember that every single individual and every single citizen of this country is a precious national resource who we need to respect and who we need to nurture the next one is educating the learners about a world of interconnectedness covid-19 is a pandemic that has shown the world both the rich and the poor how globally interconnected we are there is no longer such a thing as isolated issues and actions. Difficulties are common. What China experienced is what America experienced, is what Italy experienced, is what India is experiencing, is what UAE is experiencing, is what Pakistan is experiencing, and any other country of the world is experiencing. It's the same virus. How are we interrelated? My dear friends, if you recall, it was the United States of America, the highly sophisticated and most powerful country in the world that asked India for hydroxychloroquine. 
We have a team of Indian doctors and nurses and paramedics who have flown to the UAE to support UAE in the fight against COVID. We are interconnected. We are interdependent. The glaciers melting is not their concern. It is our concern. Indiscriminate mining in any part of the world is our concern. The earth becoming hotter is our concern. So our concerns are common. And therefore the spirit of interconnectedness and synergy is common. Communication with the outside world would help our learners to understand interrelatedness the interconnectedness and navigate across boundaries to leverage the differences and work in collaboration. The next one is uh, the design thinking process. The design thinking process is basically an approach to equip persons with confidence to deal with real world difficulties, problems, and challenges in a creative manner. It is an approach that is used to creatively find solutions to the problems that we encounter or the problems that we experience. The, the New York uh, Times best-selling best -selling author of, uh, of the book, The Element, the most sought after speaker and TED speaker, education and creativity expert, Sir Ken Robinson, had this to say about creativity. And I quote, schools kill creativity. He said that schools kill creativity. And he further went on to say that we do not grow into creativity. We do not grow into creativity, but we grow out of creativity. Or rather, we get educated out of creativity. A child, when born, is so creative. What happens to the child as the child advances in a so-called system of education? Right from elementary education to secondary education, to tertiary education, what happens to the creativity of our children? Why is it lost? Is there a gap somewhere? And that's precisely what I'm saying. We need to realign the way we look. We need to realign our perception. We need to rethink. We need to re-engineer. We need to return. We need to return the will of doing our work. So this particular design process has five different phases and the five different phases are discovery, interpretation, ideation, experimentation and evolution. Once again, the five different phases are uh, discovery, uh, interpretation, ideation, experimentation and evolution. Um, just to take an example. Uh, people living in XYZ village in India are facing an acute shortage of water. There is an urgent need to construct an underground water tank that we call an underground sump such that the tank can hold a capacity of 20,000 liters of water. 20,000 liters of water. What would be the best dimensions of depth? along the z-axis, the breadth and the length so that it can be constructed with minimal cost. That's the problem. Okay. Now, surprisingly, this is a real world problem. If you go to a conventional teaching, we would say, or rather we would give our students, this is the length, this is the breadth, and this is the height. So therefore, what is the capacity of water that this particular, that this particular sump or tank can hold? But here what I have done is, I'm looking at the end product. I'm looking at the product. And I want them to come in words. 
the process of thinking that is involved here is much complex it's much complex because the teach because the learner has to now analyze break down and make sense of every single bit of information that is presented in there and this is called real world learning so if i'm going to do this now let's 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 look at this so let's consider this to be let's consider this to be the sum that uh, would go in the ground so this would be my height this would be my height this would be the breadth and this would be the length this would be the length so these are the three dimensions the child has to compute and also one very important thing that is what would be the best dimensions of these three variables such that the cost of constructing will be minimal so the very first thing if i'm going to use this uh, design process is discovery discovery the first step i have a challenge how do i approach it what is my challenge is to construct an underground sump that can hold 20000 liters of water second one is interpretation conventionally we would give the length the breadth and the height but here what's given to me what is given is the volume of water it's going to hold the capacity is 20000 liters so i need to now break down and i need to interpret the problem the third one is ideation and ideation is concerned with generating ideas multiple ideas so what would a learner do well some may just hang their boots and say hey i don't want to do anything about it this is too complex you are asking me giving me you know and end, the end product and asking me to compute these variables it's too difficult there would be some people who may approach it in novel ways okay for instance someone may, may do something like this find out the factors of 20 and if i find out the factors of 20 i have 2 2 and 5 2 by 2 4 4 by 5 20 or i have 4 5 1 that's 4 by 5 20 and 20 into 1 is 20 or i have 10 by 2 into 1 which is 20 into 1 is 20 different dimensions so i have generated several ideas by using a combination of factors the next phase i go into experimentation i go into the phase of experimentation and i go on testing all these ideas that i have generated and i try to find out the best idea the best idea or the three best values such that i can construct the tank or the sum with minimal cost and the last one is evolution and the evolution is i have come up with the solution i've come up with the solution and here i'm going to implement the solution so my dear friends my dear friends my dear learners um it is this particular design model can be used for simple things to more complex things and when I say more complex things, it can be applied to systems. The next one is, and very important thing is, learning through risk taking and failure. Taking a risk, and if you fail, risk and fail, risk and fail, are the two words we always get so very scared of. Risk taking and failure, they go together. And so we have put into our minds, that failure is an enemy failure is an enemy and therefore better stay out of it don't even venture if you're going to fall into trouble you will fail you know uh, mark zuckerberg once said the biggest risk is not taking any risk in a world that's changing really quickly the only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is not taking a risk. We need to encourage risk taking. Failure or success is an outcome. Both are powerful. Both are powerful agents because both teach us 
both are equally important to our progress. When we take a risk, we unlock that power, that potential, which is within us. Not that being afraid of failure kills innovation and drive. Failure must be a part of learning. If failure is not a part of learning, it is no learning. It means that you're always sitting on safe ground. And what happens when life, when life hits us bad? We do not know what to do. When we see failure, we get so scared and we run away. We become so meek like ship and we run. That's not what education is supposed to be doing for us. Education is supposed to be developing in us the faculty to stand strong. That is what a great Swami Vivekananda said. And I, and, 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 and I spoke about and I, and I quoted what he said a couple of minutes ago. When we learn to take a risk, we learn to steer our thoughts. We learn to reflect. We learn to question. We learn to think. Critically, we learn to monitor ourselves, we learn to monitor emotions, we learn to motivate ourselves, and we learn from the whole experience. In simple words, we learn to become leaders of our learning. We learn to drive our life. And remember, leadership is one of a critical skill that is required in 21st century learning. Let me give you a simple example. In a class of 100 students that I have in my second year B.Ed., I just threw a question at them. And the question was, uh, was pretty simple. Again, a real world question. And uh, the question was this. Uh, uh, how much, you know, we have the wooden chairs, uh, wooden chairs, and these wooden chairs are more than 50 years old and we are, we are, you know, we, we love them very much because I sat on the chairs 20, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. And so many other people sat before that. And so, you know, they're very close to our hearts. And so my question to my students was this, how much of the floor area is occupied by the chair that you are sitting on? How much of the floor area is occupied by the chair that you are sitting on? And guess what? I had many faces that were staring at me, not knowing what to tell me. I did not know whether they wanted a clarification. I did not know whether they knew what I was asking them. I did not know what was going on in their minds. But yes, I was happy when some of them just stood and probably that was the first time they looked at the seat on which they were sitting or rather the seat of the chair on which they were sitting. Because many a times you don't even know on what we sit. Yeah. <laughs> at, at times you don't know on what we sit. So probably that was a learning experience for them because they saw on what they were sitting that day. And then the next question is, how much of the floor area is occupied by the chair you're sitting on? Some of my students, the brilliant ones, they came up with ideas. And I told them, you will not you will not leave the cat out of the bag because I want everyone to give me some sort of an answer. And then there were some in the class who told me, sir, sir, we need a meter scale. We need to measure the dimensions. And I asked them one question. I said, my dear students, you have learned mathematics in school. Simple mathematics. And there are so many skills involved. One of the most simpler skill and a very pertinent skill and important skill that we need to carry on in life with us. And that is the skill of estimation. Looking at the chair, I should be able to roughly estimate its dimensions. I just need two dimensions. I need the length and the breadth. And that would tell me approximately the, the surface area of the floor that is occupied by the chair. Then another experience is uh, I got my students to create virtual field trips. Some of them were apprehensive. Some of them were apprehensive because they were doing something like this for the first time. A big risk. 
what if I fail? And I said, if you fail, it's fine. No problem whatsoever. It's absolutely fine because I allow my students to commit blunders. I allow my students to fail. And trust me, they rise from failure. And they not only created their virtual field trips, but they created their YouTube channels and they uploaded those virtual field trips on the YouTube channel. Another example, very often, you know, uh, coming into uh, research, you know, you, uh, some of you are BA students, um, construction, construction of an achievement test. Or I go a little deeper and I say construction of a diagnostic test. How do I construct it? There's so much of fear. It's so much of sweat. Fear grips us. We need to send that fear away. Construction of a rubric. There's so much of fear when I, when, when I talk about rubrics and construction of rubrics. Why? Looking at a two-dimensional structure puts fear in minds of learners. The next one is making use of... Uh, the next one is making use of uh, of uh, problem finding problem finding problem solving oh wow oh, you know we say we we do a lot of problem solving problem solving is done uh, is done quite a lot we find solution to a problem or we find several solutions to a problem and we choose the best or maybe two of the best what is problem finding Problem finding simply means problem discovery. So one spots a problem within a hole or a gap within a problem and that becomes a problem. I'll give you an example. You know, we talk about fallacies and you enter into class and you write, you just write on your chalkboard one is equals to two and you'll have the learners looking at you. Hey, my God. One is equals to two, one is equals to two, one is equals to two. And some really believe one is equals to two. And then you prove it and you arrive. One is equals to two. And some, I hope, they don't believe, but some do believe. You need to spot, you need to spot the fault. You need to spot the problem. There is something that is mathematically incorrect in there. So, we need to we need to train our students we need to train our students in in problem finding in fault finding to spot where the error lies so problem finding requires an intellectual and focused vision uh, to find out what might be missing or what should be added to something using this strategy teachers can provide students with an opportunity to think deeply ask critical questions and apply creative ways to solve problems when i take a, to take an example you know when we talk about when we talk about research there are times when we think when we think that our methodology is amazing it's right it's great and then critically look at it you may spot a fault. When you look at analysis of data, sometimes I have seen people, I have seen people. Okay, I have seen people and I've seen two people doing this. I'm not generalizing, please. I'm not generalizing anything, but it's an experience. I have seen a person testing hypothesis, significance of difference between means of a, of a paired sample using the t-test for independent means and so spotting problems spotting errors it's only when we learn to spot flaws problems we learn quite a lot problem solving definitely will help us to arrive at solutions but more important than problem solving is to spot an error or to spot a difficulty or to spot a problem you have a newspaper and the newspaper gives you you know so much of news you need to you need to go within that and find out hey is this authentic are there any aberrations in there 
are there any inconsistencies in there so in other words you are spotting errors we as teachers we as teachers need to create flexible learning environments for our learners there has to be flexibility we can't be rigid we can't be rigid anymore there has to be a lot of flexibility a lot of give and take there has to be a lot of democracy in the way we function in our classrooms we also need to give up this way of thinking and believe that all subjects are equal we learn we need to learn to respect that all subjects are equal and every subject has its own relevance and importance and it correlates with every single subject psychology correlates with assessment and evaluation assessment and evaluation we make use of in all spheres of learning mathematics science history geography language they are all together we need to go beyond the boundary of a subject and understand how fluid the boundaries are we can't be talking about compartmentalized teaching we need to go beyond boundaries and i hope we are doing it the next one is e learning technology during this whole pandemic has entered our system in a big way it has entered our our system in a big way and technology is going to leave but we really do not know the impact of our online teaching on students we do not know its effect nor its impact on learning it will take us a long time to understand this but yes as i said after the pandemic when you know the schools reopen the systems of learning open we need to be focusing on two things and this would be done by the teachers and we also need to train our students to create e materials all said and done the two things that we need to focus on are bite sized learning bite sized i mean b i t e bite sized learning and what do i mean by bite sized learning is is its focus on just a single learning outcome it may span some say 3 to 5 minutes but the focus is on a single learning outcome and the second and the second concept is micro learning on nano learning micro learning on nano learning again uh, focuses on teaching and delivering content in in very small specific burst so these are the two concepts which we will need to bring into our classrooms remember the spans of attention are becoming lesser and lesser and therefore the information that goes across to our students by way of e learning will probably have to follow different formats whatever format we follow these two concepts will chase us bite sized learning and micro learning which we also call nano learning okay uh i think uh, i've done my presentation um you know uh, uh i look at uh, vijayshree jaiswal and and uh, and uh, the question is so in this virtual world how many educator educate the heart of students um my dear friend uh, i i want to i want to tell you that uh, the pandemic 
has brought some sort of a craze, a craze for digital technology. You and I, we really do not know for how long this craze will remain. You know, it's, 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 it's something like a boom. It's a boom, a big boom. For how long it will remain, we really do not know. But we need to remember that even if we have elements of online learning or e-learning, electronic learning, we would still be a part of the classroom. We will be a part of the classroom and the teacher will still be a part of the classroom. No matter, even though we are in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, wherein you know we see our life being changed by artificial intelligence and the internet of things and all other technologies that are walking into it. Our roles, our roles will definitely change because technology is going to define and determine the roles that we play. But yes, the learning of the heart and the learning of the mind will continue. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pallavi, for saying for for saying that happy atmosphere is most important. Yes, you know when you when you when you have when you have happiness when you have happiness in your learning environment, children feel that freedom, and I think that freedom to learn is extremely important. Uh, uh, Nishita has Nishita says that um, a teacher needs to bring in a change in her teaching methods by using technology. Yes, I agree with you, Nishita, but technology is not the only thing. Technology is not the only thing. Technology is one of one of the devices or one of the tools that we integrate in learning. So we cannot, we cannot make technology, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking for a good word. We cannot make technology our boss and technology dictate to us how we will teach. No, it's not going to happen. It's a classroom. It's our students who will decide how I'm going to how I'm going to execute learning. How I'm going to execute learning. Um, Uh, there's a question from uh, Vijayshree again. I think I, I'll address this question. Um, it says, if students are not getting what ambience around them, where where they can concentrate on education, then okay. What I understand from your question, Vijayshree, is that uh, if if um, if the if the surroundings or the atmosphere, if the surroundings or the atmosphere is not conducive, is not conducive to learning, how can they get educated? A very pertinent question. I answer this question by just uttering a phrase. Where there is a will, there is a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. There are street children who have done it great in life. There are so many people who have done great in life and probably if you maybe if you enter in your own personal life where you are today is because of the ingenuity of your mind the sacrifices that you have made that has helped you to be where you are uh, uh, Rashmi Singh uh, okay uh, she's asking me uh, what should be the ultimate goals of education uh, <laughs> okay, uh, you know, I am not the ultimate to say what should be the ultimate goals of education. But yes, I would say the ultimate goal of education to be to create a good person. A good person creates, a good person, sorry, makes a good citizen. A good citizen, a good citizenry, a good citizenry and the nation progresses. The nation progresses and the world progresses. So the ultimate goal of, of learning, the ultimate goal of education is for development of all the faculties of the human being. That's what, that's what education is for. Um, 
again uh, rashmi uh, your second question uh, how can we foster uh, creativity in children rashmi before i can before uh, you know fostering creativity i just keep aside in our students we need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves how creative am i and i'm and i'm very sure rashmi you have neurons firing at this point of time because you've asked me this question how can we foster creativity in students which itself means that you are creative so being creative i am sure you can foster creativity in children you've learned to to you you've heard two of my examples i'll give you a simple example um uh, okay um you know i i belong to science and maths and i'll just take a simple example uh, just a single a simple example in science we have a plain mirror p l a n e we have a plain mirror and textbooks textbooks tell us this that a plain mirror shows lateral inversion lateral inversion so what is right appears left and what is left appears right and it tells that there is no inversion top down that is what textbooks tell us you go to the internet and you will find the same thing but the reality is that the plain mirror does not invert anything top down nor does it invert anything left right it shows you what it shows you exactly what the object is and we have been confusing learners by telling learners hey to learn about uh, the simple mirror and the, the sorry the plain mirror you need to go and stand in front of the mirror okay you stand in front of the mirror and you raise your right hand and you ask yourself which hand has gone up and you, you you conveniently say if your right hand goes up the it was your left hand in the mirror if you raise your left hand it's the right hand that goes up in the mirror and this is how we have to start it this can be taught creatively okay uh, rashmi uh, probably i can i can i can send you a video that i have that i have created to explain this whole concept in a very creative manner give me another example you know we 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 we, we talk so much about we talk so much about uh, sorry another example in science uh, we talk so much about combustion and we have a habit of rattling concepts whether children understand or they do not understand you know i have i have i have entered into class and i have and i have taught a whole lesson in science and combustion my demonstration literally bringing nitrogen gas in a in 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 the in the tube of a two wheeler produced carbon dioxide gas in the class the only thing i could not is oxygen because that would be combustible there would be a rapid reaction and we arrived we arrived at the conclusion saying that none of these gases support combustion other than oxygen creativity okay uh uh i think i have just two minutes uh, uh i have just two minutes uh i have just two minutes and uh uh i i'll, I'll just take one question uh this is what uh, rashi tripathi says so along with giving online education to students there is a need to evaluate the learning outcomes achieved by students as every child is different and have and have their own individuality so we cannot expect every child to learn equally from online learning exactly so this is what i'm trying to say we do not know the the impact and the effect of learning we really do not know we do not know anything of this at this point of time it's going to take us time it's going to take us time and it's going to be research based um and uh uh my good friend patanjali mishra uh has this to say he says teachers are not trained with technology owing to this pandemic they are bound to use it what is your suggestion for them uh my dear good friend patanjali 
you know, we are very close friends. Uh, Patanjali, teachers, all teachers, irrespective of whether you have just joined the profession, you are midway or you are almost at the end. For a teacher, a career does not end. It's just a number that tells us you have to vacate the formal system. We need to learn technological tools. We need to learn. We need to learn. And you can self-learn. And if at all I can help you in some way, I'll be extremely happy to help you. Thank you.